new ideas, new ways, new methods are often faced with challenges and rejection from others. Take Galileo was branded a heretic when he held that the earth moved around the sun. Joseph Lister had to fight for antiseptic technique in surgical operations. Martin Luther King, who fought for racial equality, was seen as a threat and unpopular by the system. These and so many others have had to teach us and pave the way for civilization to see what's new, what's possible, what's different. In Jesus' time, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, could not accept, could not adjust, or embrace God's radical newness in the person and the ministry of Jesus. It was the religious system that pushed against Jesus' teaching and healings, his teachings and healings around the Sabbath, the sense of the proclamation that the kingdom of God knew had arrived. They pushed back, and often it was against them that he had those fierce debates and differences as they struggled to see the newness of God in the in-person of Christ. Author Adam Grant, who's a professor at Walton School of Business, and has several books that he's written, including the most recent one, The Hidden Potential, writes, most people are custodians of the past instead of being stewards of the future. It's a powerful statement. Most people are custodians of the past instead of being stewards of the future. And if we are to be stewards of the future for our lives, for our family, and for our church, we need to make room for the new, for the unexpected, for what is different, for what is not comforting but brings discomfort to us. We as a church need to embrace the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us, in the midst of us, as the Holy Spirit seeks to move us into new levels of ministry and work. Thus, today I want to talk about making room for the new. Our sermon text is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, 33 to 39, and in your Bibles in the pew, it'll be page 837. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? He asked the question. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. Then he told the parable. He said, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. No one pours new wine into old wineskin. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and the, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. Both will be destroyed. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskin. And no one, after drinking the old wine, wants the new. For they say the O is better, making room for the new. The religious leaders come to Jesus. They had just watched Jesus spend time with tax collectors and sinners, and they were so discomforted by the fact that he would hold company among these people. And having experienced that, they continue the conversation and push Jesus in a different direction from a different angle. They're wondering why do the disciples of John the Baptist and the Pharisees fast and yours go on eating and drinking? I mean, that's the kind of Jesus I want to follow. <laughs> <laughs> 
Fasting was part of the Judaism, and it was in the law that once a year during atonement, they would all fast, but they also fasted for emergency moments in life, and they fasted. The Pharisees fasted twice a week, and John the Baptist's disciples fasted. And Jesus' response to them is, is not to diminish fasting, but is to assert that the time is not now for them to fast. And he compares it to a wedding banquet. And in those days, it was the family of the uh, groom that will celebrate. And it was not a one-day celebration. It took place for a few days, and there was dancing and drinking and eating. And if Jesus was saying, I am the bridegroom. I have come. And this is the time for the disciples to celebrate, for the disciples to, not to fast. No one is going to fast during a wedding banquet. No one is going to fast. I'm not going to ask my disciples to fast now while I'm here. But the time will come when the bridegroom is no longer here and they will fast. And if you go and forward to the book of Acts, you read that the early church practiced fasting as well. To make his point a little stronger, he tells a parable, two illustrations to further make his case. That combining the new with the old is incompatible and the consequences are negative. He said if you tear a new garment and you patch it to an old one, you will destroy both the new garment and you'll fail to match it to the old garment. Matthew and Mark tell the same story and one of them tells it that if you patch it, the new and the old, the the new has no ability to shrink, so it will tear as you wear it. And then he goes on to talk about wine. That's a good topic too as well. He said, pouring new wine into old wineskin will burst the old wineskin and the wine will run out. Both will be destroyed. Got to understand that they will take animal skin, the sheep, and they make uh, a, a, a place to hold the wine, but over time it will become brittle and old. And anytime you put new wine, as it gets fermented, the gases begin to push against the skin, and eventually that will take place. Both will be spoiled. Now, most of us, when we get wine, we get a bottle. I haven't seen anyone walking around with a wine skin. <laughs> But for them, Jesus knew exactly how to illustrate so they could make the connections and understand. Old skins are, are not able to expand. Lack the, they lack the elasticity. So when the wine is fermented, it tears both apart. See, the religious leaders did not recognize the newness of Jesus. They didn't recognize that he was forgiving sins and they had a hard time when he forgave the paralytic when his friends brought him down to, into the house and the first thing he did was to forgive him. They struggled with Jesus' authority to forgive. When they found him eating and having a party with tax collectors and sinners, which was new, what would a rabbi do with such people? They don't hang out with these type of people. That was new. When he healed in the Sabbath and challenged them, they struggled with that. When he denounced the religious structures and the rules that were oppressing the people, they could not see the newness of God, the incarnation of God himself in Christ Jesus. They wanted to mold Jesus into the old religious way. They wanted to put a patch him into the old cloth, the old system. But new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And then the, 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 the passage ends by Jesus saying that those who drink the old wine, they don't want to try the new wine because they say the old is better. How often have you heard that statement or even said that? The old is better. 
And as we get older, I don't know about you, that's a struggle. We like the old, the familiar, the comfortable. Is it me? I just want to make sure I'm not the only one in that place. We yearn. I mean, it's a struggle. It's a tension. But at the same time, God is always at work doing a new thing. And I want to share four quick points about making room for the new as a community of faith, and you can take it as well individually. Making room for the new doesn't mean letting go of all the old stuff, the old traditions, the beliefs and practices that there are many that re remain relevant and truthful. You don't give up everything. Nothing doesn't mean that you embrace the new for the sake of the new. Sometimes we embrace new things just because they're new. Doesn't mean that we have to do that. Two, making room for the new means discerning the old stuff that needs to go so the new can come in. How many of you have participated in a rummage sale, a yard sale, garage sale? Ain't that a, that's a trip. <laughs> because you get emotionally attached to things and your husband is saying, get it out. And you're saying, I've had this for 30 years. <laughs> it's having that kind of yard sale where you have to discern what old stuff needs to be sold or let go. For someone who's lived in five states, after a while you figure that you have to travel light sooner or later. And trust me, I've let go of many books and for some reason they all come back to me. <laughs> and I got to do it again when I leave here. It's letting go and the more you do it, the more you realize that these things are not as relevant as they once were. And I don't know about you, but my wife and I want to make sure that when we pass away, I'm not leaving that work to my kids because I know what they're going to do. <laughs> Where's the cash? <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> uh, in order to discern what we keep and what we let go on a spiritual sense and as a community of faith, we need the guidance of God. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need the guidance of God's Word. We need the guidance of history to remind us. I mean, Martin Luther, the great Reformation that in October 20, 2017 was 500 years celebration, stood and said, indulgence are not part of what Christ came to do. We don't earn our salvation through works. And you know what they did to him, right? In Spanish, they say, afuera. You're out of here. But God was doing something new, and thus began the Reformed tradition that we're part of. Third, making room for new means having an open mind and spirit for the new that God wants to do and is doing. You might recall there's a story of Peter and Cornelius, the centurion, and Peter, the Jewish leader of the early church, and the Holy Spirit is trying to lead Peter to realize to go visit Cornelius. And he shows him a vision and a dream of different animals that they don't eat as part of the culture and religious. And the Lord is trying to teach him that what he makes clean is clean. And it is that introduction and that visit to Cornelius' house of the Gentiles when Peter realizes that the Gentiles are very much part of the kingdom of God. And that means us, my friend, that God's kingdom was broader and bigger. Fourth, making room is not being so invested in the present order of, religious, of, being, of the religious system that we cannot welcome God's action of bringing about a new thing. We need to be open. But God is always doing something new. A new generation rises up. New leaders must come up and lead new pastors. 
My time will come to an end at some point, and you will get a new pastor. You need to make room. His jokes will be a little different. (laughs) You need to make room. Room for whatever the choir leads us into. Whatever the children's ministry begins to envision the new vision of God. So let me try to bring this to an end. People, all of us, religious, non-religious, we all struggle. We live in that tension. The religious people like the Pharisees have a kind of passion for the old, and we struggle with the new. The rule of thumb for many people, especially as we get older, is always stay with the old. And for others, always go with the new. But for most of us, it's the tension between the old and new, trying to discern the way forward. Jesus said this to his disciples as he talked about scattering the seeds of the kingdom. He said, Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. And blessed are those that are able to see and hear the newness of God taking place. May the Holy Spirit help us to respect the earlier traditions, practices, and at the same time embrace and advocate a new vision of God in our midst, in our life. God took a young man like me who started preaching at 15 in a Pentecostal church at 26 goes to seminary where the Reformed tradition is part of it. And God moves Elba and I from the Pentecostal tradition into a Presbyterian tradition. How you doing? <laughs> the good thing was services went from three to one hour. It was God's way of saying, need to move you. And I've thought about that so many times. But you know what? The newness of God in our lives has been such an incredible blessing. I've had the opportunity to preach in many churches, to be an interim pastor and work in nonprofits. I would not have traded that call of God shifting me slowly into a different tradition and expanding my view of the world. May God help us to see with new eyes and to hear with new ears the newness of the gospel today, especially as we prepare these young children, young families, we need to think how to do it in a different way. These, I was at the beach recently, and I saw a four-year-old kid in a little tent after he played in the water came, and all he did was, I think that kid was four, no more than four, it could have been three, and he had a phone and he just kept going. God. I mean, you and I, what did we do it for? That was not our world. The world is changing. God is calling us to see his newness and continue to be his presence here and today. Amen.